Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's two minutes past one, so we might make a start with today's program. Uh, can I first introduce myself? My name is Stuart Moucher. I'm the Acting Executive Director for Family and Community Services Insights Analysis and Research, otherwise known as FAXIA. Um, I'd like to open by acknowledging the Aboriginal people as the First Nations people of New South Wales and that wherever we are dialing in from today, we are all living on Aboriginal land. I have the privilege of living and working on the land of the Bedjigal people, uh, and I acknowledge and pay my deepest respect to First Nations elders past and present and to young and emerging leaders. Uh, I wish to extend that respect to all Aboriginal people of all nations and to acknowledge the ongoing connection Aboriginal people have to this land as its original custodians. Uh, a warm welcome to all our webinar participants today. Uh, in particular to our presenters and also to our many frontline colleagues working across the state um, for DCJ or with one of our many not-for-profit partners. Just a couple of housekeeping items to begin with. Um, I do want to let everyone know that today's session is being recorded and ask that everyone keep their microphones and cameras off throughout. Uh, after the presentations, I will lead a Q&A session so please put any questions you have in the chat um, and I will put them to our presenters at the end. So why are we all here? Well, we know that children and young people in out of home care are overrepresented in the youth justice system, which is why it is so important that we find ways to support these children and young people and divert them from more serious criminal justice involvement. This webinar will focus on a summary of the evidence and literature that can inform policy and practice in this field and we'll showcase a pilot study and a new district-based program that is focused on this vulnerable cohort. The program today will start with Dr. Kath McFarlane. Dr. McFarlane is the Adjunct Associate Professor with the School of Population Health at the University of New South Wales and also the Director of Kath McFarlane Consulting. Dr. McFarlane will provide insights into recent Australian and international research that has examined the crossover between out-of-home care and young people with youth justice contact and the resulting policy and practice recommendations. Next, we have uh, Professor Chris Trotter from Monash University and Dr. Philippa, Philippa Evans from the University of New South Wales. They will talk about a pilot study of a single session family work intervention for at-risk young people and their families being undertaken in regional New South Wales. And finally, we are joined by Jordan White. Jordan is a project officer with Youth Justice and will present on the crossover kids. Who are they and how do we best support them? She will discuss how caseworkers can support these children and young people uh, and outline a new joint initiative between Youth Justice and Community Services in Sydney, South East Sydney and North Sydney District. I really want to thank everyone um, for making the time in your busy schedules to attend today. Uh, I, I, for me, it reflects a collective commitment and passion to make a difference and achieve the best possible outcomes we can for kids in out-of-home care. I hope that you can make the most of the opportunity today to hear, to learn and reflect on where we can make changes in policy and practice to prevent children and young people in out-of-home care from becoming involved in the, uh, in, in the justice system. Uh, with that in mind, let's get started. Uh, and it is my absolute pleasure to hand over to Dr. Kath McFarlane. Thanks, Dana. Several Australian studies published in the last decade have looked at aspects of young people in out-of-home care's involvement with the criminal justice system, specifically their role as offenders. A term you've probably heard lately to describe this group is crossover kids, although dual status, dual involved or dual service clients are terms commonly used in the USA, Canada and the UK to describe the same group. These Australian studies involved over 43,000 young people across New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. They employ differing methodologies to examine how kids with child protection histories, and particularly those in care, end up being arrested, remanded and sentenced to custody in proportions that far exceed those of young people without care experience. Importantly, they have come to essentially the same conclusion. That is, that crossover kids are an extremely small cohort that occupy police, court and legal resources disproportionate to their size. So let's start with some statistics for context. Kids in care comprise less than 1% of the Australian child population. It's been estimated that 19% of children in care in Australia are involved in the justice system as offenders. The New South Wales Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research in 2016 linked child protection and criminal justice data for almost 18,000 young people who had a caution, youth justice conference or a court appearance in 2011 and 2012. They found that approximately 10% were or had been in out of home care. 
and the Victorian Sentencing Advisory Council, which published a series of reports into crossover kids in 2019 and 20, found that one in six children diverted or sentenced at court had been in care. In comparison, the ABS says that only 4% of 15 to 19 year olds in Australia are preceded against by police each year. This doesn't factor in those 10 to 14 year olds who, as I'm sure you're all aware, given the current debate around raising the age, can be held criminally responsible for their actions. The figures are hard to compare because everyone is using different methods and cohorts. What we actually need to understand, however, is that at each and every point of the justice system, kids in care are there and they are overrepresented. What is also important to understand is that despite years of recommendations that the crossover between the out of home care and criminal justice systems be addressed, we still do not have any formal mechanism for identifying whether someone in the justice system has been in care. The police do not collect this data when they caution or arrest someone and make decisions about bail. The courts do not collect it when they remand someone or sentence them to custody. Juvenile justice does not publish it, nor does adult corrections. The obvious question is why not? Especially when the studies have shown us that kids in care are overrepresented on criminal charges, on community orders and in detention. One focus of policymakers and practitioners has been the particular demographics of young people in care identified in the literature. Chiefly, the overrepresentation of Indigenous youth, girls, of young people with so-called complex needs, and those who've experienced maltreatment pre-care or adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. The New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice Pathways of Longitudinal Care Study, POCLS, provides some insight into crossover kids. Zhao and colleagues in 2020 published information on linked data child protection um, administrative data and that from the Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research Reoffending Database to examine the likelihood of a first offence among 859 young people who entered care for the first time with no history of criminal justice contact. Over a quarter of the POCLS cohort had a formal contact with the justice system within just the following three and a half years. Those more likely to come into contact with the system and who did so in a relatively short period after entry into care were older at placement about 12 to 14, were male, indigenous, exposed to neglect or had a history of risky behaviour such as drug or alcohol use, um, and had predominantly lived in residential care or in supported accommodation. The POCOS study is really important, not only because it's enabled external researchers, myself included, to have access to previously unobtainable government held administrative data, but because it's seeking to provide some insights into the pathways and characteristics of young people in out-of-home care who offend and to compare them with those who do not. A South Australian study by Marvasso and colleagues in 2017 also utilised linked administrative child protection and justice data for over 17 and a half thousand young people. They found that gender, ethnicity and placement in out-of-home care, my pages are stuck together, uh, placement in out-of-home care, um, moderated the association between child maltreatment and subsequent youth convictions. To give just one example, they found that Indigenous youth were over 13 times more likely to be convicted of breach-related offences compared to non-Indigenous youth. However, apart from demographics, researchers identified that the child welfare and the justice systems themselves play a significant role of, for why we have kids crossing over. This is vitally important because crossover kids are also disproportionately offended against, for example, as victims of family and domestic violence, peer-to-peer -peer maltreatment and institutional abuse. The New South Wales Legal Aid Commission in 2011 found that 80% of its high service uses um, were children who were in the service of the Children's Legal Service, approximately half of whom had been in out-of-home care. These clients each required an average of six legal services. Significantly, these legal issues commonly involve problems with out-of-home care providers, including residential care staff's over-reliance on police, the failure to lodge victims' compensation claims, and failures to develop leaving care plans mandated under the Act. The Victorian Legal Aid Commission in 2016 provided information about a type of care that is now pretty much universally viewed as inherently criminogenic, and that is residential or group home care. The Commission found that a third of young people in resi care required legal help for a criminal matter. They were three times more likely than other kids to have contact with police and to face criminal charges, and often for very minor matters such as breaking a cup or throwing food. Importantly, although the fact that residential care is meant to be restricted in almost all cases to children over 12, 
um, over two thirds of the kids were under 14 years of age when they became involved with the justice system. Both commissions found evidence of entrenched and systemic unwarranted criminalization of children in out of home care. In 2018, the Victorian Commission said that the link between ResiCare and entry to the justice system was, quote, stronger than first thought, with two out of three kids in ResiCare needing help within the first 12 months of their placement. Other research, mine included, has examined children's court case files in an attempt to put some numbers to the anecdotal accounts of care crime overrepresentation. My analysis of 180 New South Wales children's court files in 2009-10 identified that almost half of the kids appearing before the court were or had been in care. These children were disproportionately more likely to progress quickly through the justice system, to be breached for non-compliance with bail conditions, to be remanded in custody, and to enter the system at an average of nine months earlier than kids with no care experience. They were entering at, three, at under 13 and a half years. I stress that these findings relate to all children in out-of-home care before the court, including foster and kinship, and not exclusively residential care. Some years later, Badaway and Sheehan in Victoria and McGrath and colleagues in New South Wales replicated my methodology and confirmed that kids in care were overrepresented in the justice system. Again, they were younger when cautioned or arrested, more likely to be charged if in resi care, and had higher sentencing outcomes with greater occurrence of remand periods and custodial sentences. Refocusing on demographics thus only tells us part of the story of why some kids in care offend. This was made clear in respect of the overrepresentation of Indigenous young people in care in the justice system by the Megan Davis Families Culture Report. She examined the circumstances of 1144 Indigenous kids who entered care over 18 months in New South Wales. She found that being in care increased the risk of justice system involvement due in part to systems issues such as placement instability, a lack of cultural connection, and a lack of stable accommodation for kids in custody and those seeking bail. She found that the impacts of colonialism and the institutional racism, structural inequity and disadvantage in both child welfare and justice systems shape offending pathways. The Families Culture Review confirmed that care criminalisation, a phrase I coined in my PhD, was prevalent in New South Wales. Care criminalisation describes the process whereby children in out-of-home care are disproportionately impacted upon by aspects of both the care and justice system in circumstances that would not lead to involvement in a police involvement in a private family home. For example, when residential care staff rely on police to manage children's behaviour, police refusal of bail to run away or missing children who offend in the belief that they will not turn up to court, judicial decisions to place youth in secure detention for their own protection, and the increased police scrutiny in residential or group care placements. Davis also confirmed my conclusion that care related offending was a reason for the crossover. This happens when kids come into contact with the justice system for offences that arise out of or are unique to the care environment. In my research, over a third of the offences that were before the court were directly attributable to the child's placement. Almost half involved damage to property and a third involved assaults against staff, co-residents or kinship carers. Many of these care related offences were however minor and they should have been avoided, especially if workers have employed strategies other than relying on police to manage bad behaviour. Finally, Davis also confirmed that care specific trauma lay behind much of the offending. This arises when structural issues in the child welfare system increase the likelihood of crossover of kids who've already experienced immense loss and grief including the death of family members and multiple incidents of abuse at the hands of trusted adults. This is made worse by a lack of support services, multiple and changing caseworkers, separation from siblings and unsafe, unstable placements for children. The studies are full of other examples of systems issues that impact on young people in out of home care's offending. In South Australia, for example, a higher number of placements is associated with a greater likelihood of convictions, especially convictions for violence. Research has found that placement instability, however, preceded involvement in the justice system and stated that this finding should potentially rule out arguments that suggest that behaviour leads to placement instability. In New South Wales and Victoria, the so-called vexed relationship between being in out-of-home care and not having appropriate accommodation is a serious problem that arises when judicial officers send children without suitable accommodation to custody even when the likelihood of a custodial sentence if convicted is practically non-existent. 
They do this believing that a detention centre is a safer option than releasing a child to potential homelessness. This is actually permitted under New South Wales legislation. The section 22 of the Bail Act allows the court to remand a child in custody until facts or JJ can locate suitable accommodation. But this provision is deeply inequitable. For young people in care who are facing criminal charges are likely to be refused bail on these grounds when their carers refuse to have them return to their placement following arrest. In Victoria, the Sentencing Advisory Council's review of the records of over 5,000 children sentenced or diverted from court in 2016-17 found that more than half of the children in care had only offended during or after being placed in care. It identified lost opportunities for concerted and coordinated action across service systems before the child started offending and concluded that while experiences of trauma and maltreatment are likely to be causal factors in children's offending behaviour, the experience of care itself was also a contributing factor for many. In 2019, the South Australian Guardian for Children and Young People identified that almost a quarter of those detained in the Adelaide Youth Training Centre were in out-of-home care. She said that it's not that these individual children and young people are inherently criminal, but that systems make their criminalisation more likely. She found that systems abuse is prevalent in the lives of what they call dual involved kids and was highly critical of the inadequate planning, policy, procedure and communication across government and non-government systems, which meant that kids in care who needed therapeutic support were channelled instead to the justice system. She pointed to crossover kids who were kept in detention days after they'd actually been granted release because child protection authorities had no homes for them to go to. She identified that some crossover kids elected to remain in detention once they'd reached the end of their sentence because they felt fearful and unsafe at their care placements where serious physical and sexual abuse was being perpetrated between young people. She ultimately concluded that the state's child protection system was struggling to undertake its core function of keeping children and young people safe. A month or so ago, The Guardian released a follow-up report that examined the circumstances of 51 dual status kids who'd been detained on 124 separate occasions in just six months. She found that kids in care accounted for only 1% of the South Australian child population, but that they comprised almost a third of children in detention. She also found that worryingly this percentage was increasing. Dual status kids' numbers are remaining steady, even as the numbers of other kids in detention drop. Since data collection has started in 2017, the number of crossover kids in South Australia has grown by more than 20%. And this has been attributed to residential care, um, which appears to cause criminal or offending behaviour. And they've warned that systems bias could be contributing to the overrepresentation, particularly of Aboriginal kids in the youth justice system. On a sobering note, um, I'd like to now hand over to my colleagues, Dr. Philippa Evans from UNSW and Emeritus Professor Chris Trotter from Monash to present on single session family work. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So we're going to talk about a project that we've been undertaking in the Western region of New South Wales with Youth Justice and Mission Australia, um, single session family work. Uh, I've got that working. Um, yes, so it's, it's a project based on um, uh, collaborative family work. There, there's a book, Collaborative Family Work. Um, we have the reference for you. Um, and it's also based on quite a bit of research which suggests that single sessions can be effective in working with young people and their families. Uh, so, so the model, this collaborative family work model, also known as ANTS in, in the region, um, it, it's based on a fairly straightforward problem solving model where it's been delivered by two workers in the past in, in a longer session. And we're looking um, in relation to this current project at providing this over um, 
single sessions rather than uh, a longer intervention. But essentially, it involves working with family members through initially setting ground rules, identifying problems, deciding which problems to work on, setting goals, exploring what's been tried in the past, what's worked and what hasn't, etc. And then looking at strategies to address those issues. Um, so the, the family work Um, the, the, the family work involves delivering this to families in youth justice. Um, we, we've had, of course, to get agreement from the, firstly, from the individuals, individual young people and their family members. But we've found fairly high levels of uh, willingness to participate in the project. Um, prior to being involved in the family work, this is the longer version of the family work, which we've been doing now for around about 10 years in the western region of New South Wales. It involves um, two days training for the staff and a lot of support in terms of preparation for the work that individual workers do with the families in pairs and a debriefing uh, after each family work session. Uh, these, these are some of the references publications on the uh, family work model and it, it has we have found uh, we have done quite a bit of work on, on this and have found that it has been uh, particularly successful in terms of uh, the responses from the young people and also in terms of uh, lowering recidivism so th the project has been in a longer form has been underway in the western region as I said, for up to 10 years with more than 100 uh, clients and their families. And more recently, we've been doing research into the effectiveness of the intervention. Um, so we've had high levels of completion. Now, what I'm talking about now uh, is the longer form of the intervention, which we're currently in the process of adapting to a single session intervention. But uh, in talking about the longer form of the intervention, we, we've had, um, when this has been undertaken in the family home, which is really the way in which the model has been designed to do to, for workers to go to the family home in pairs and work with family members over a number of sessions on um, addressing their family problems and um, trying to work out methods of, of dealing with them with the ultimate objective of reducing recidivism rates. So the completion rate in the family home, and when I say completion, I mean that's completion of, uh, of an average of six sessions, um, was 83%, which I think by any estimate is a very um, substantial and impressive completion rate for youth justice interventions, particularly when they involve families and particularly whether when they're ongoing in this way. There, were, was, there was much lower completion rates when they were done in the, in the, uh, in the office. Um, this is, identifies the people who are taken into custody or received a sentence of custody within two years of commencing the family work, in the completed family work group, we had 14%, the not completed group, 33%, but they're a small number. Um, the decline, so people who were offered the family work but declined, it was 37%. And we also had a matched control group of people who were suitable for family work but were not offered the family work because it wasn't available to them at the time, but they are matched in terms of risk levels. And so we, we found a significant improvement um, over each of the control groups for those who undertook and completed the family work. And actually uh, a, a clear improvement for anyone who even started the family work regardless of whether they completed, if you combine the completed and not completed together. Uh, we also found there's 97% um, saying of the family members saying that they felt the 
apparently it was helpful or very helpful. And very similar responses from staff when we interviewed um, uh, staff, similar numbers of staff, around about 60 staff in terms of how they found the process. Many of the staff felt that they felt um, that, that they increased their skill level and gave, gave them a great sense of uh, pr professionalism and skilled intervention, um, effective workers because of the way they um, could work with the families using this family work model. So, as I said, we've been doing this family work model for now about 10 years in the Western region. And we're looking, because it is quite resource intensive, we're looking at the possibility of applying this model in, in single sessions so that it can provide wider reach to more families. So it's the same model, it's the same Ridges model, working through um, identifying problems, finding, uh, setting goals, etc. In, in the family group. But we, we are now in the process of offering this in, in the Western region with Mission Australia and with Youth Justice as a single session, partly based on the fact that single session interventions in terms of restorative justice, family group competing, have been, have sh been shown to be successful in the past and, and single session interventions based on developing and improving family relationships. So um, we're now in the process of implementing this pilot project, uh, the single session, in anticipation that we can deliver it more widely than we have been able to the, the longer form of the intervention. And, and uh, University of New South Wales, uh, led by um, my colleague um, Philippa, is uh, researching the project. Thanks, Philippa. Thank you. So as Chris mentioned, um, there's different models of single session intervention. However, the models tend to have certain elements in common. They're clear about the time limits and the purpose. Um, they are concerned with addressing the issues um, central to the family members, and they also encourage family members to devise practical solutions to their problems. The single session collaborative um, family work model that we're looking to evaluate includes these features, but it's also incorporating practices that have been shown to be effective in a criminal justice um, setting. So that includes things, as Chris mentioned, like pro, uh, reinforcing pro-criminal, um, pro-social comments and pro-social um, uh, actions of family members and young people. So the model really focuses on young people and their families to develop and identify aspects of family interactions which they'd like to improve, um, setting modest goals and practical ways of achieving these goals. The intervention includes a brief follow-up session in which um, families can provide feedback to workers about their experience of the intervention as well as their progress. So whilst there's emerging um, evidence base to support the use of single session family work, the research in the criminal justice realm is still rare. This study that we're undertaking is important because it's going to allow us to advance knowledge about the use of an economically viable and time efficient intervention. But it's also going to help us understand if the, this model helps young people and their families to improve their relationships whilst also reducing the risk of reoffending. So Chris just briefly touched on this, but I'll just, just to finalise and summarise our, um, our presentation, just talk a little bit about our research design. So as Chris mentioned, the UNSW has approved and given ethics consent, and we're also in the process of gaining consent from the Aboriginal um, Health and Medical Research Council of New South Wales. Um, we've also been working alongside the communities uh, and forming an Aboriginal governance group, which is going to be a key part of our project, ensuring that we've got an established platform where we can provide um, significant input and concerns of our Aboriginal representatives. So in terms of evaluating the program, prior to commencing the program, families will be asked um, to rate the extent or the nature of the main problem that they'd like to address. We're then going to follow up with families within a week and get a sense of how they then rate the problem after the session, as well as how they found or the helpfulness um, of the intervention for them. And we're also going to speak to workers at that point to get a sense of how they felt the um, single session family work went. 
We also are going to uh, re-interview families and young people three months after the intervention, again, to rate the helpfulness of the intervention um, and get a sense of if um, the problem that was identified has actually decreased in the severity and frequency with which they are experiencing it. We're also seeking reoffending data from Boxer um, to get a sense of if the young person has had any further offences, court appearances, arrests or warnings. We're really aware of the limitations of this type of data, but it, um, it, in terms of some of the offences and may not be resolved or some of the offences may have been dismissed. However, it is going to provide us with some additional information about the uh, young person's ongoing contact with the criminal justice um, system post intervention. So we're really looking forward to receiving your questions at the end um, during question time. And I have now got the great pleasure of introducing Jordan White, who's going to look at some of the practical implications when working with crossover kids. Thanks very much, Chris, and you for that. Uh, my name's Jordan White. I'm a Youth Justice Project Officer, and today I'm going to be chatting to you about um, who the crossover kids are and how best we can support them. Uh, First, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands um, that we're all working from today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are joining us on this webinar today. I pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity, knowledge and strength of the Aboriginal peoples and their um, ongoing cultures and connections to the land and water. Today, I'm presenting from Darawa land. So a bit of background, uh, the Youth Justice Practice Team sits within the Policy and Practice Directorate in Youth Justice New South Wales, and one of our key functions is to develop and set practice that is consistent, system-wide and grounded in evidence and research. So we know from today that children who have child protection involvement are known to have poor outcomes, and one of these is the increased likelihood of youth justice contact, supervision or custody entry. And there's been a growing body of uh, research and national calls as PIP and Kath and Chris have all um, highlighted in regards to these young people's trajectories and how best we can support them. So having had casework experience in out of home care, uh, child protection and working with these dual clients, today's presentation will focus on a scoping review that was carried out in the practice team, um, as, as well as the relevant practice impl implications of, this scope, of, of the young people's trajectories. Um, if today's presentation is of particular interest to you, the Youth Justice Research to Practice Network will be holding a lengthier presentation on the crossover young people in 2022, early 2022. So there's a clear link between maltreatment and delinquency. Young people with child protection contact are at least 12 times more likely to offend having had uh, youth and, and have youth justice contact. And First Nations young people are particularly vulnerable to this trajectory at 16 times more likely to have youth justice contact having had child protection contact. Uh, as Kath pointed out, this is known in the literature as care criminalisation or the care to custody pipeline, and these young people are known as the crossover kids. To the best of our knowledge, the scoping review of the literature that was carried out is the first to scope the domestic research of crossover cohorts, as well as research that directly engaged with stakeholders that have direct contact with this um, cohort. So 36, uh, 36 uh, research um, 36, yeah, sorry, 36 research was um, included in the scoping review and um, a thematic analysis was carried out highlighting six key themes in the literature that these young people um, encounter or experience. Further, there was consultation that was carried out with New South Wales DCJ caseworkers um, to inform the practice implications that I'll talk about today. A bit of housekeeping, I'll talk about these key, six key themes, but as I go through the six key themes, I'll talk about the theory, but also the practice implications of each of those six key themes. So the first, first key theme that's highlighted in the literature was childhood diversity and trauma. Crossover children experience more cumulative harm and maltreatment compared to other children, and often this uh, harm is characterised by destabilising environments. So crossover children commonly experience family and drug, um, family drug and alcohol abuse, severe mental illness within the household, household violence, and criminal justice system involvement within the household. It's also been highlighted that ch crossover children experience an extraordinary amount of childhood bereavement and loss in the form of either parental separation or the death of a parent, sibling or close family friend or friend. 
So this means that for crossover children, trauma and attachment related disorders are really common and therefore supporting these children requires us to be ongoing, um, to be stable and ongoingly committed to supporting them. So it's particularly important that caseworker changes are minimal and if there do have to be caseworker changes, that handovers are robust so that there's um, good communication within the caseworkers and we know how best to support these young people and that's been passed on to the next caseworker. Caseworkers should, go on, should show ongoing commitment to supporting these young people through strong use of rapport building and trauma-informed responding. The next key theme to be highlighted in the literature was maltreatment type and timing. So neglect and physical abuse are common predictors of adolescent offending. And there's an increase as the, um, the increased risk of offending is positively associated with increased entrenchment within child protection systems. So this means that poly victimised youth not only have the most complex maltreatment histories, but also have the most voluminous offending. Importantly, transition points have been highlighted within the literature as key timeframes when maltreatment increases and therefore delinquency also increases. Um, so transition points are high, uh, that are highlighted include things like moving from primary to secondary school, um, placement changes, changes to statutory care arrangements, transition from care to independent living and graduation from the out-of-home care system. So this means that identifying harm and particularly neglect because it's harder to identify should be done early by child protection practitioners. We need to work with families to increase positive attachment bonds and caregiver capacity for these young people. And so caseworkers should focus on holistic and collaborative practice with align aligning their goals with other service providers. So this means having regular workers meetings with the other service providers you're working with, um, picking up the phone if you're from child protection and talking to your youth justice counterpart about how best to support this young person. So preemptive support, particularly around transition points and the developmental window of adolescence, um, is really useful in de-escalating risk for these young people and will provide timely wraparound support when behavioural escalation or crisis does occur for them. The third key theme to be um, highlighted in the literature was offending onset and context. Crossover children offend at a younger age at greater rates and more violently than others. So often, often offending occurs in three key contexts, as um, Kath pointed out. The first is that adolescent is adolescent family violence, where it, where young people um, behave aggressively with externalising behaviours, and this is often related to long-standing conflict between them and their caregivers. The second is residential care-based offending. So this has been attributable attributable to the fact that adolescents in residential care are more heavily monitored, and often um, de-escalation practices do involve police attendance at those. Care homes. And the third key context was in group offending and it's been attributable to the fact that this appeals to these young person's sense of belonging and attachment but this also means that they're highly vulnerable to further exploitation when they are offending particularly if they're under the influence of any substances when they're offending. So this means in practice that um, all three of these offending contexts really highlight that reducing conflict with caregivers and increasing belonging and attachment to positive role models and peers is paramount for these young people. So practitioners should focus on increasing caregiver capacity during early engagement and risk assessments and thereby reducing relinquishment in the future. Parent education regarding adolescent development and de-escalation strategies or safety plans is really important, as well as engaging the necessary parental support so that they can implement those safety plans that we work with, that we work with them for. So responses to young people should continue to be increasingly trauma-informed, preemptive in support strategies, and provide de-escalating and decriminalizing responses. Next key theme to be highlighted was educational disadvantage and disengagement. Crossover children have high instances of disengagement and disadvantage in education that's related to their unmet protective, mental health and disability needs in the context of complex family and care environments. Offending, um, sorry, often disengagement from school occurs during transition points, whether this is inside or outside of the school environment. And this is exacerbated if young people are met with punishment such as suspension or expulsion from the school environment. Importantly though, schools and educational environments are really well placed to identify disadvantage and disengagement early. And it's also been shown that with supportive um, educational responses, we can successfully re-engage these young people by, because this provides stability, encouragement and belonging for the young person. So supporting educational and training endeavours for the young person and what they're interested in in those endeavours is really paramount. Caseworkers should work closely with school personnel that have good rapport and a positive relationship with these young people to encourage their engagement. 
And um, encouraging engagement also comes from working with aligned practice with school personnel. So again, workers meeting um, and in some cases supporting those young people to get to school practically. So for instance, I've had um, you know young people or other caseworkers walk their young person to school every Tuesday morning or give them a lift to school every Tuesday morning. This provides not only obviously attachment to you know stable and pro-social uh, adult role models, but also an ongoing stability and routine for that young person that they can rely on. So the next key theme to arise was co-occurring challenges. Crossover young people obviously have really complex histories and therefore they're more likely to experience things such as behavioural disorders, severe mental health issues, drug and alcohol abuse, neurodiversity and cognitive impairment. In practice, identifying these issues early and engaging the appropriate supports is likely to increase carer capacity and reduce their relinquishment. So specifically screening for things such as neurodiversity or cognitive impairment within child protection and out of home care assessments at the point of engagement when the child is young will assist in early identification and referrals to the appropriate services such as NDIS and other support services. So as caseworkers, for example, we all know in practice the NDIS is really hard to navigate um, and it's often a lengthy process and that's the same with other support services. Um, this is exacerbated if we're trying to do that when, uh, you know, we're, we're meeting the point of adolescence and caregivers are exacerbated with behavioural escalation. They're trying to understand um, things such as adolescent window of development on top of trying to understand how mental health, cognitive impairment or drug use may be affecting their child's behaviours. So if parents and caregivers are supported early to navigate NDIS, and other support systems and receive funding. This makes it easier to access that support at the point of behavioural escalation and reduces caregiver stress, thereby automatically increasing their capacity at that point. The final key theme to emerge in the literature was uh, the First, First Nations, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people being grossly overrepresented within crossover cohorts. Whilst First Nations families do experience higher levels of family adversity, this does not wholly account for crossover overrepresentation. It's, it is that First Nations crossover young people experience intergenerational trauma directly related to the colonial practices and specifically the perpetration of the stolen generation. Further, these young people continue to be exposed to more vigilant policing practices and discrimination through over policing and culturally insensitive child protection practices. In practice, this means that caseworkers must collaborate with family and community members formulating case plans and support for these First Nations young people. We need to continue to increase our cultural education through training and responsiveness, but the ongoing consultation and relationship building with culturally relevant supports and community and family members is really paramount for these First Nations young people. Just to recap today, preventing ongoing system entrenchment for crossover young people is really important, and we can do that by identifying and preventing harm and co-occurring challenges early in these young people's trajectories through increased family support and capacity building, encouraging positive attachment, connection and belonging for these children. Diversion away from child protection and youth justice systems for crossover young people is also very important, and this includes collaborative and holistic case management that focuses on preemptive and de-escalating strategies at the point of behavioural escalation, with particular focus on vulnerabilities associated with destabling events and environments at transition points. Finally, responding appropriately to crossover young people involves understanding the particularly traumatic and destabilising experiences that they have endured. Holistic and collaborative practice by all stakeholders that care for the child should be trauma-informed, decriminalising, culturally safe, child-centred and specific to that young person. If I leave you with anything it is, any, a key message from today, it's that crossover children experience increased and more cumulative maltreatment and adversity. These children are more likely to be among the children convicted with earlier onset, rapid escalation, more violent and more voluminous offending. They have more complex histories, challenges and understandings of the world that they experience. By def definition though, this also means that they are some of the most incredibly resilient children that you'll ever meet because they've experienced far greater adversity and loss than many adults will ever experience in a lifetime. This means that supporting crossover children requires each of us to be stable and committed practitioners that are empowered to actively listen to their experiences, hear what they need and act and advocate based on these experiences. Thank you for listening today. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send to the practice team and I'll hand over to Stuart now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Jordan. Um, and can I obviously thank all our presenters uh, Kath, Chris, Philippo uh, and Jordan again. Um, uh, I think it's safe to say that it's uh, uh, pretty
pretty sobering uh, realization in terms of some of the statistics that have been shared with us today. Um, and obviously an incredible challenge that we collectively share as, as professionals working in, in this industry. Um, so we now have uh, 10 or 15 minutes for questions uh, from the audience. I haven't seen any pop up yet, um, except some, uh, about where with certainly links to the website where this material will be recorded and slides will be uh, presented after today's session. Um, so can I please ask those online, if you have any questions, please pop them in, in the chat and, um, and we'll put them to our presenters. So while people are thinking about their questions, I might start with a couple of my own. Um, if I can start with you, Kath, uh, again, thank you for sharing a range of statistics that I think is safe to say left everyone a little bit, um, uh, you know, troubled by, uh, to put it mildly. Um, you talked a lot about um, other jurisdictions across New South Wales and inter internationally. I guess was also keen to hear if there's anything from your research where other jurisdictions have you know, solved some of these problems better than we have in New South Wales and things that we could be bringing into our service system. Um, yes, thanks very much for the question. Um, there have been some successes in some other jurisdictions. I was lucky enough to go to the United Kingdom and meet with um, Surrey Council who were dealing specifically with kids in out-of-home care or as they called them looked after kids and in just a year they'd managed to reduce this massive overrepresentation so that only four of the young people they were dealing with had had previous out-of-home care and justice experience. So in just a year by um, doing a lot of work and basically accepting that they were the problem. That's what I found so refreshing is that they realised things that they'd done because it had always been done or because they um, thought that this would help the kids. Um, they rethought it all and they found that they had in fact not engaged in the most appropriate practice. So that was a great example and there's lots of material available. Um, you can look up Surrey Council and it will tell you um, exactly how they did it and how they had that behavioural change or cultural change that was needed. Um, in New South Wales, just briefly as well, I'm sure you're aware we have um, the protocol to reduce the unnecessary criminalisation of children in residential care. And that uh, has the potential to be very important and it's certainly been adopted also in, or a version of it in Victoria and in South Australia, uh, uh, sorry, and in Queensland and meant to be happening in South Australia and possibly the Northern Territory. That essentially is a, a, about a casework of practice between police and juvenile justice, but particularly facts caseworkers to try and stop police being the first point of call when kids are behaving in a way that's difficult or um, becoming involved in offending. Um, unfortunately, it's really hard to get any information about whether this is actually working. In theory, it should because it's based on research that's been conducted overseas and models that have worked and shown how to reduce the overrepresentation of care kids in the US and in the UK. But um, nothing's been published in New South Wales as to its effectiveness and that itself has been complained of by the Ombudsman and the Guardian. So hopefully we'll see some research coming out and facts data being released that will actually show that the joint protocol is not only being implemented, and I see someone's asked that question now, um, that it should have been implemented three years ago, um, that that hopefully is now being implemented statewide and that we will soon see the results of it in terms of less kids sent to court and less kids charged by police. Great. Thanks, Kath. Um, uh, question uh, for, for Chris and for Philippa. Um, I think we we're all thinking while you were presenting, um, basically, is this uh, single session intervention going to be available for kids in out of home care? Um, and I guess there's knock on a bit uh, question from that. I mean, Chris, to the research that's already been done on the, the longer form intervention, has that sort of shown or, you know, involved kids in out of home care? And has that sort of shown, I guess, uh, you know, consistent uh, efficacy through, through those uh, trials? The, the model has been used without a home care, the longer version of the model, usually between six and ten sessions, has been used um, in a, quite widely in out of home care as well as in youth justice. The, the research that we've undertaken that I've been involved in has been uh, only in youth justice. Um, but um, it, it is certainly, I, I believe, potentially the single session um, intervention, a much better option than taking people off to police, even for uh, residential care workers and, uh, who are having difficulty with behaviour of young people. Um, and in many situations in helping keep families together, 
or helping address specific problems. It's it, the model is designed for young people who are having difficulty functioning in, in their family settings and exposed to child protection or to uh, youth justice interventions. Although the research we've done on it has been more specifically in youth justice. Great, thank you. Um, Jordan, if I can come to you next. Um, firstly, can I just say also, I absolutely appreciate, um, greatly appreciate your key takeaway. I think focusing on the, the resilience and strength of these uh, young people in overcoming such you know, massive obstacles in their, in their young lives. Uh, you know, I, couldn't, I couldn't salute that message uh, more. But a number of questions uh, in the chat, I guess really people wanted to get into the practical sense of it, you know, building care capacity. Um, you know, can you talk to us, what, what does that look like in practical terms? Yeah, so I guess it can mean really simple things in regards to psychoeducation around adolescent development. So in terms of working with um, with carers and with parents, um, you know, I think child protection do do a lot of work with parents early on around, um, you know, childhood development and key developmental stages. But when we get to adolescence, um, we kind of forget that, you know, brains are developing as well there. So even just or even parents do too sometimes, um, even just things that are, you know, psychoeducation around the fact that adolescents' brains are different to adults' brains. And whilst they might look like an adult, they're not an adult yet. And they don't understand things like adults do, um, particularly children that have had, you you know, maltreatment backgrounds have trauma and attachment related disorders. Um, they're not understanding, you know, um, uh, punishment and reward the same way that an adult might understand that. So there are some really great, um, you know, infographics, really simple things that we can leave with parents to read over later on around adolescent development. But it also means things such as practical supports for parents. So that means that, um, like I said, you know, support systems like NDIS or other support services that might be speech and pathology for the young person, if that's going to be something that supports them or psych services for the young person. Um, implementing those practical supports are all going to be things that reduce a parent's stress or a caregiver's um, stress during behavioural escalation and therefore increase their ability to kind of not be, I guess, as we speak of it, like flipping the, the parents aren't flipping their lid as well at the same time that, you know, adolescents are flipping their lid and they can respond in much more metered, um, in metered ways that, you know, de-escalate the situation. Great, thank you. And, and, and look, and that brings me back to something, Kath, you said in your presentation, and I must admit I wasn't quick enough to write it down. So if I can take you back, you talked about the relationship between um, placement instability and behaviours, and I guess which one comes first. Um, can I take you back and ask you just to, to sort of expand on that again? Sure. Um, that was in relation to some research um, that's been recently put out in coming from South Australia, although it's been replicated. Um, the Davis Inquiry in New South Wales made similar comments. But what one of the things that people often get caught up on is this causal effect, and they say that the children act out, and if the children didn't act out, we wouldn't have placement instability because the carers would be able to deal with them. So what the researchers in South Australia looked at was specifically around the timing of when the children were becoming involved in the justice system and that placement instability to see if there was actually um, any grounds or what points at which appropriate intervention could happen. What they found was that the placement instability or these unsafe or tenuous placements actually happened before the kids became involved in the justice system. So it might have been a tipping point that once the kids became homeless as well, um, that that's when police stepped in or that's when whoever was then temporarily looking after them relied upon the justice system because suddenly the carers aren't there either. But what it also does is it um, the argument that the researchers made was that you can't get away with um, a superficial understanding and saying, well, of course, these kids have got um, place and instability. Of course, it's not really our fault because they're at, they act out and they're bad kids. That's not the situation. They actually found the kids were reacting to often inappropriate caregiver behaviour. Um, or a whole lot of stresses going on in the child's life that needed to be understood in order to um, understand why placements were breaking down. Sometimes it's a good thing that a placement breaks down and some instability is actually really important. But it also pointed out, and this is what other research re is really clear on, is that placement instability is really damaging when it's brought about because of the young person's offending, when the cares, carers, whether that's family carers, kinship, foster, or particularly residential, refuse to have the child come back 
if they've been charged with an offence, that's when they're basically doomed to stay in the justice system. And we know that the criminal justice system itself is criminogenic. So if we're looking for a tipping point, place in instability should be immediate red flag that something's going on and that we need to stop these kids being sent to justice because there's basically nowhere else for them. Absolutely, thank you. Um, a question from the chat from, uh, from Ilan, uh, I'll pose this to any of our panel members. Um, raising the uh, minimum age of criminal responsibility is certainly a bit of a topical issue in the media at the moment. Does um, anyone want to offer a view as to how that might uh, make a contribution to what we're talking about today? Um, I'll jump in. No one else wants to go first. Go, it's all yours, Kath. Okay. Um, I think it's a really important question and it's one of the um, really disappointing things for me in respect of the debate around uh, raising the age. It's crucial that we raise the age to at least 14, in my view, um, and keep kids out of the justice system. But one of the, the disappointments is that it's often presented that the care system is essentially a good place for them to go. The care system is not a good place for kids on that verge of becoming involved in the justice system to be sent to. It will become, if it isn't already, a de facto justice system in itself. So raising the age is the first part of the conversation. It will keep those younger kids who, although still small numbers, are predominantly those in out-of-home care um, or who have been in out-of-home care. It will stop their involvement until they're 14. But I think we also need to look at why is it that as soon as kids hit 14, the numbers suddenly skyrocket into the involvement in the justice system. It's because they suddenly can be prosecuted or, or proceeded against. So the out-of-home care cohort is younger, much younger, um, generally speaking, particularly if they're Indigenous kids and particularly if they're male. And they're Raising the age may slow that, but it's just the very, very tip of the iceberg of what needs to happen in order to stop the overrepresentation of kids in out of home care entering the justice system. Fantastic. Thank you again. Um, look, that brings us really to the end of the time that we have for today's session. Uh, sorry that we haven't been able to get to all the questions in the chat, but again, thank you for everyone's participation and contribution, and, and we'll certainly have a look at those and see if there's any there that we can. Um, get to with the material that will be put up tomorrow. Um, can I also take one uh, last opportunity to thank our presenters, uh, Dr. Kath McFarlane, Professor Chris Trotter, uh, Dr. Philippa Evans and Jordan White. Um, but also can I thank everyone for taking the time uh, to join for today for such an important discussion. Um, with that, I hope today's provided everyone with some, some new insights. Um, with some, uh, some some food for thought and uh, you know new opportunities that that we need to collectively fuel our collective commitment and passion to um, to support these children uh, and keep them away from the justice system. Um, we all need to share that collective commitment to achieve the best outcomes we can for kids in our home care. Um, and I know it's 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 one that is uh, that's well supported by this group. So can I thank everyone again for joining us today. I hope uh, today was as informative for you as it was for me. Um, and so again, thank you and have a great rest of the day.